Good morning, folks. How are you today? This is uh, Pastor Cooper coming to you, and we're again, Landon and I are sitting out in the front yard at, at our daughter's house and, her mom, and his mom's house. And May and June throughout Southern Baptist Convention is known as a time that we recognize families, Mother's Day, Father's Day, and we recognize the uh, senior adults. So today I want to recognize and and talk about senior adults, not only from Southside Baptist Church, but for any senior who is watching us today. And I begin with a little story that I picked up this past week. It said a couple in their late 80s, almost 90 years of age, uh, he and his future wife went into a local drugstore and they asked for the pharmacist. And as they walked up, the older gentleman said, sir, do you carry a line of vitamins? And he said, yes, we do. Well, do you carry Depends, crutches, a walkers, boost? Oh, yes, sir, we carry all of that. And the pharmacist looked at him and said, sir, why do, you, uh, why do you ask about these things? It seems that you're getting around quite well. And the old fellow says, well, we're planning on getting married in a couple of months, and we want this to be our vital registry right here in your drugstore. Well, there's a lot of folks like that, I guess, today. Today, I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you have one, please, to the Psalms, Psalm 71, verse 9 and verse 18. The psalmist says, Cast me not off in the time of old age, forsake me not when my strength fails. Verse 18, Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have shown thy strength unto this generation, and thy power to everyone that is to come. And then if you will please turn over with me to, in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And Ecclesiastes chapter 12, we're going to look at the first eight verses. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return their rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they're few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened, and the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. When also they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way. The almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail. Because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. I had a preacher friend once upon a time. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. He and I used to pastor in, uh, close together. And he had a dear old mother. She was 85 years old at this time, and uh, a senior adult group was going on a bus tour and he carried his mom out to the bus and helped her get on board and he looked at her and says now mama you be good and have a good time and she replied with a twinkle in her eye well make up your mind which you know someone said that an aunt who married so late in life that medicare picked up about 80 percent of the cost of the honeymoon there are a lot of jokes going about growing old but folks it's no joke when you look in the mirror 
and you notice that it's too late for all of Olay, or it's too late for that daily dosage of Rogaine, and it's just not working. George Burns said many years ago, and I quote, you can't help getting older, but you don't have to get old. Growing older is a matter of age. It happens with the passing of years, but getting old is a matter of attitude. You're as young as your faith and as old as your doubts, as young as your confidence and as old as your fears, as young as your hopes and as old as your despair. So I begin today by asking, when does aging begin? Well, the aging process begins the moment we're born. And it ends when we're either snatched away or the body says, I've had enough and I quit. Every one of us must face the reality of aging. Now we can do that with calm assurance or bitter regret. Are you the one who said when you were looking in the mirror one day, mirror, mirror on the wall? I really don't feel that old at all. I would remind you that the security of the Lord is extended to the end of life and beyond. Now, some folks have problems with growing older. Why? They're losing uh, youth, which the world really praises. Or they're losing their beauty, which the world worships. Or they're losing their status, which the world really respects. Or they're losing their position, which the world honors. Listen, folks, none of these values that the world thinks are important, they're not eternal. So I want you today to think about aging with proper perspective. Aging is scary. I don't believe that the scary part is losing beauty or losing strength. I think the scary part is the what ifs. The psalmist said, do not cast me away when I am old. Perhaps that's the worst fear of all. As we grow older, that we become a cast off. You know, older people are no longer respected as they were in Bible times. It used to be an unthinkable thing to leave an elderly person standing up in a bus aisle while a younger person sat. That's not true anymore. An old adage says that time and experience are the greatest teachers. Why don't we see that logic today? I mean, folks, you don't have to be up riding on a pogo stick to be productive in the church and in the community. It's absolutely amazing when you think about it, how older people have achieved so much success. At age 87, Michelangelo's painted the Dome of St. Peter's. At age 83, Tennyson wrote Crossing the Bar. At age 90, Judge Oliver Wendell Holmes handed down some of the most brilliant legal opinions of his time. At age 81, Benjamin Franklin helped frame the United States Constitution. At age 80, George Burns won an Academy Award for Sunshine Boys. At age 80, Jessica Tandy won an Oscar for Driving Miss Daisy. At age 99, Abraham received a promise from God that he was going to become the father of many nations. At age 85, Caleb asked for his mountain to conquer. John, uh, the disciple John, was age 90 when he wrote the Revelation. Now, these people grew older without getting old. They stayed alert and they continued learning. Now, beloved, listen to me today. We need our older people. Someone wrote some time ago that in our churches, regardless of what the denomination might be, for each senior adult who passes away or moves away, it takes five young couples to replace them. We need older people. We need them to help us to keep our perspective, to, to pray for us and help us through spiritual battles, to counsel the young. You see, the opportunities for service are endless for our older people in the churches today. Somewhere between the rocking horse and the rocking chair, 
we have to set some goals for ourselves. And listen to me, we live with those goals in mind and we reach out for them. And when God is in control of your life, it takes the fear out of the what ifs. And when you come to the place of dying, you come to that place with serenity of spirit and it absolutely baffles the world. They can't understand that. I have another question for you. How do we grow older and not grow old? We make plans for the future. And then we discover that the future is about as dependable as a weather report. So I want to offer four suggestions today. Number one, keep physically fit. Physical changes come with age and some affect our vanity and some affect our vitality. Someone wrote down one time, there are five B's of aging. There's baldness, bridges, bulges, bunions, and bifocals. And then someone else said, time is a great healer, but a lousy beautician. I've heard men say, and maybe you have too, I can do as much today at age 70 as I did when I was 20. My thoughts and my answer to that was, you didn't do very much at 20, did you? A doctor at Duke University Hospital says, those who are living the longest today are those who are refusing to give in. Keep busy. So suggestion number one is keep physically fit. Number two, keep your mind alert. In the last few years, I've had several close friends who have been affected by what we call Alzheimer's or dementia. One of the dearest friends I have today that lives in Pennsylvania. I've known him now for almost 40 years, he and his wife. And uh, he is facing this. I talk with him ever so often and the, every time I talk, he's losing a little more and a little more of his memory. It happens. Gray hair doesn't mean fuzzy thinking. So listen to me, friend. Regardless of your age, you never learn all that you can learn. And you never develop your brain as much as it can be developed. So keep your learning process moving. Don't let it end. So number one, keep physically fit. Number two, keep your mind alert. Number three, keep your faith focused. You know, faith is one of the essential ingredients of life. You can't live one day without faith. Let me ask you this. Can you live one day without believing in your wife or your husband? Can you live one day without trusting your bank or your insurance policy? Can you live one day without believing your physician? Every time you get in your car, crank it up, put it in gear, and get it to moving, you're, you're expressing faith. When you buy or you sell on credit, you are expressing faith. When you get married, it's faith. When you go out to eat in a restaurant, you exercise faith. Our faith should be centered in the Lord Jesus Christ and our confidence should be in Him. An old man and a little boy were sitting on a dock fishing. And the little boy asked why the sun sets red or why the rain falls and why the seasons change. And then he asked the old fella, does anybody ever see God? Son, said the man in reply, looking across the water, it is getting so that I hardly see anything else. Suggestion number four, as we think about growing older, not getting old, Keep your heart yielded to God. Moderation is not enough when it comes to loving and serving the Lord. The Bible tells us to love God totally, completely, with our whole being. Now, the senior years of life are not a time to drop out, back down, let up, or slack off. The call to commitment has no age limit or expiration date. As long as we live on this earth and as long as we breathe a breath of air, we need to give our best and our highest 
to Jesus Christ. You see, the secret of the Christian life is not to try harder, but to surrender more. Another old man was dying and he said, I have found that all the sugar is at the bottom of the cup. Many years ago, there was a musical that came out that Bill Gaither had written and put together. And in that musical, it was called Alleluia. There was a song that was sung that I think about occasionally. He says, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him, more love to me he bestows. Each day is like heaven, my heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter it grows. Now, sunset may be just ahead for some of you, and even for me. But let's remember and not forget that it is Christ who adds the color to that sunset, the glory and the beauty. And as I close the message today, someone penned these words a long time ago. Grow old along with me, the best is yet to be, the last of life for which the first was made. Our times are in his hands, who said, a whole I planned, youth sees but half, trust God, see all and be not afraid. Thank you for being with us today as we, uh, you've allowed us to come into your home and we're, we're so grateful for that. And I just want to thank Landon again for filming this for us to record it so we could get it to you. And let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for our senior adults. Not only here at Southside Baptist Church, but throughout, throughout anywhere, they're older people. We have many older people that are in our care facilities, nursing homes. And many of them are fighting a battle today like never been fought before in their lives. And we pray for them. We pray for the, the senior adults in our churches who mean so much to, to us. Their service, their faithfulness, their help, their work. God, how we thank you for each of them. And we ask that you will bless them even with greater strength as they endeavor to live day by day and to grow old with you. And Lord, today, help us, help each and every one of us today to finish well. Thank you in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Hello again, Southside friends, Pastor David and Emily coming back to you. And I really do feel like uh, we're starting to make good friendships just from our conversations with people in the Sunday school classes with the Zoom meetings. So we want to actually pick up this week uh, where we left off last week. We have one question from last week we want to get to because it's a, it's a really good question. So Emily, will you read that question to me? Okay, so how do you feel about seniors in a congregation? So I like this question because we've spent most of our ministry working with seniors and we've had nothing but good interactions with our seniors. They've been a joy to us and I, and I hope we've been a blessing to them. But we also know there's unique challenges with senior adult ministry. Um, one challenge is to make sure that we are taking care of them in a way that both provides for their needs but also helps them grow. Um, we don't want to just um, neglect our seniors because we assume they have nothing to give. But at the same time, um, it's not just uh, senior adult playtime, right? We, we actually do have to push our seniors to grow. So with that in mind, um, I plan to spend a lot of time with seniors. But at the same time, I'm probably going to need help finding programs, activities that are good and, and benefit the seniors. So we'll be looking for help for that area because I'm just not good in general at, at planning and programming. No, he's really not, y'all. So um, uh, we look forward to our seniors, and we can't wait to see you when we get there. Okay. All right, the next question is, what part of the pastorate are most energizing and most depleting for you? So this goes along with the last question. Um, at one point, uh, counseling was very depleting. But I've learned to put some good boundaries in my counseling ministry. So I'm not trying to solve people's problems for them anymore. Um, I, I think of counseling as 
I'm here to help you help the person who needs help Mm -hmm. to find out where God is in the situation and connect them with a good resource and then to check up and make sure they're going through the process they've decided. So I've really limited my counseling ministry, which has made it far less depleting. But since counseling has uh, become less of a depleting ministry, I now know the area that is a, a real depletion of my energy. That is planning activities and events. Organizing programs, planning activities and events, that just sucks the life out of me. I lose sleep over it. You are far better at that than I am. I'm just, that's not my thing. Yeah, it's really not. But he is really good at VBS as being the character. I, I do. The theme. I, I do play characters in VBS for the kids, and I will dress up in silly costumes if that's necessary yeah. so. so he can do it but it's not pretty so the most energizing area of ministry for me is is the pulpit by far i mean every time i step in the pulpit every time i preach god's word i i feel like i come to life i feel like the lord meets with me i that gives me energy to do everything else in ministry yeah it does, it does. all right um What do you see as the function of worship, and how do you see that function best achieved? So my understanding of worship is a little bit different than what most people talk about in worship. Um, When I listen to people talk about worship in the church, they normally talk about a specific portion of the Sunday morning gathering, usually the music portion. Mm -hmm. So worship is the singing and the leading of song, all that, and then there's the sermon. So there's worship in the sermon, and and I don't think that's the way the Bible thinks of worship. In the Bible, worship, uh, the Greek word is proskuneo, and it it really means to prostrate yourself before. And we do that not just in our singing ministry, but also as we hear the word of God. Uh, We also do that in our time of fellowship, So I I think the Sunday morning gathering from start to finish is all worship. And and in that gathering, it's the time of the week where we most explicitly focus on God. I, I think it's the center of the church's life where we all gather together to tell God how great he is and and how we submit ourselves to God. So the elements of that are are two very important elements and, and what I think leadership in a church contributes to that is number one we have to come and gather and recognize god we have to help people as a leader as a pastor as as the choir as anybody to help people recognize the lord is really in this place you know when jesus rose from the dead um, he sent his spirit on the church and, and because it's his spirit he really does gather with us and so Part of the task is helping people recognize Jesus. That means helping them sing along in the songs. That means helping them hear the word of the Lord. But to really recognize Jesus. And then the second element is respond. When when we recognize Jesus through his word, when we recognize Jesus through his love and his saints, we have to respond to that by imitating his love, by obeying his word, by making commitments to do what he's told us to do. So I think good leading in worship isn't simply a job description for one person, Mm -hmm. but is the pastor's job, is the usher's job, is the Sunday school teacher, everybody together, we participate to help people recognize God and respond appropriately to him. That's right. Well, we edify one another, and as we build up one another, we help each other worship god together yeah and i think that's that's part of what edification does is as we build each other up we see more of god and we're able to respond more appropriately so emily you have your question this week uh it's very similar to a question i was asked so if you could begin a new ministry that you've never done before what would it be okay so this question was really hard for me because i would say that every ministry that i've stepped into um i've started a new ministry but it's always been based on what the need is. Um, so I'm not one, I'm not a, a big visionary person that just says, okay, I have this idea and let's just throw it into where you're at. Um, I typically come into a church environment and setting and say, okay, what's missing? What do you need? And let's figure out a way how to start this ministry. So that's more of the way I go about it and not necessarily 
poof, here's an idea, and let's throw it into play. Yeah, you really struggled when we talked about this earlier, about just coming up with something you've never done before, because you're used to doing what you've never done before. Right. But you wouldn't pass up an opportunity to take a missions trip to Scotland. No, I would not. (laughs) I would love to go to Scotland on a missions trip, so I won't pass that up. Amen. Well, again, thank you for your questions. We, we've enjoyed spending our time with you through the video and also especially through the classes. If you're not a part of a Sunday school class, now is a really good time to join so that I can jump in and get to know you before we come to Southside. And, and we're praying that all of this comes to uh, a conclusion very soon and we can come and preach to you in person. But until then, we are praying for you. We love you and we can't wait to see you again. Okay. Amen.